Last week, uh, Ryan introduced us to this epistle of 1 John. Uh, we will be talking about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, written to house churches in the area of Ephesus. John, an older man, um, this letter is dated uh, in the early 90s of the first century. Um, I love John's character. Uh, he's uh, one of the former sons of thunder, James and John. They got that name because they wanted to call fire down from heaven on the, Samarit the poor Samaritans. And they found some guys casting out demons and they told them to stop doing it because they didn't do it like they did it. And Jesus rebuked them in both cases. And, but something wonderful happened to John uh, as he continued to walk with the Lord even before uh, he uh, died on the cross. John seemed to gravitate towards the understanding that Jesus loved him. And he actually refers to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved. Now, he didn't think he was the only apostle or the only person that Jesus loved. He just dealt with Jesus uh, reflecting that, that he was so personal to him, that Jesus loved him. And it's a good way to think of uh, God and, and uh, think of Jesus as we are the people. I am the person that Jesus loves. Some people have a problem with that. I don't know why they would, but I am the person that Jesus loves. I cannot do anything to separate myself from him. Romans 8 will tell us that. So John uh, tells us in 1 John uh, 5.13 that he writes this first letter to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Hence John's empathetic language, heard, emphatic language, heard, seen, touched, and proclaim him. He's wanting us to know that Jesus, that we can know Jesus we can have a relationship with him. He's an apostle overseeing these house churches in Ephesus, and he writes to them about some serious problems that they are having, problems that have to do with three specific areas. And there were some who were attending uh, uh, the first one is, and heard some new ideas, and they, want, they left wanting nothing to do with Christianity. John would later refer to them as antichrists, Probably an early form of Gnosticism, which is still, uh, this religion is still alive today. Gnosticism in its infancy, um, it's progressed into all kinds of different things uh, as it is today, but in its infancy, as it, um, they thought that God was evil and not good. The Gnostics thought that God was evil and not good. The salvation would come through special knowledge, and that Jesus was a spirit and not really human who left his body before it died on the cross. Now, is that convoluted or what? But it's no wonder that they wanted nothing to do with Christianity if that's what they based their beliefs on. Another group among these house churches were trying to lead them astray by saying uh, that just knowing Jesus, if indeed you could know him, was not enough. And these probably were Judaizers uh, with whom Paul dealt in Galatia and many other places, uh, every place he planted a church. They're legalists uh, who were saying it had to be Jesus plus circumcision, plus rituals, plus different rites. And then there was a third fellow named Diotrephes. He's mentioned in 3 John as one who loves to be first. He was spreading vicious rumors about John and others not welcoming new believers and actually kicking some out of the church. John says he will deal with him when he arrives. I, I think of John's particular attitude. I, I love this guy. He's, he's probably almost 90 or maybe even over 90, and, and he's just sh I can just see him shouting, we've seen him, we've heard him. Look out, diatrophies. 90-year-old man's coming after you. <laughs> he says, uh, so John is writing in response to the trouble with these house churches where these fa factions and fractures and relationships are happening. And John is carried along by the Holy Spirit 
as a gospel writer, as a Bible writer, as brilliantly he gets to the heart of all these issues by saying, Jesus is very real, and you can know him, and if you know him, you'll also know the Father. In James 4.1, Jesus' brother weighs in on this from his letter, and he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What James is describing is self-absorbed people who want what they want even to the detriment of others. And unfortunately, even though we know the Lord, we can have these tendencies in ourselves. John, with great enthusiasm and clarity, will speak to these churches and rightly identify the problem. He starts with a priority. that he mentions here in his earlier book of John. It's the bedrock of Christianity. Notice what John makes very clear. In the book of John uh, 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and uh, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And in 1 John 1, 1, he starts by saying, that which was from the beginning... The life appeared. The human life of Jesus appeared. It was the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And in Genesis, our opening book of this great book, this book that is an errant, infallible, preserved word uh, by God's sovereign grace, starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ryan quoted last week from 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the human face of Jesus. I stuck human in there. I hope it's not uh, going to cause any ripples uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Christianity, but uh, I think it's accurate. God shows us what he's like in Jesus. He shines the light in our heart and the knowledge of God's glory that's displayed in the face of Christ. And Jesus tells us in John 14, 9, that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. But this is what I want to get to. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is the Bible insists that we start with God. That's where we start. We begin with him. We... Uh, 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 who begins to create heaven and earth and eventually makes humanity out of dirt. (laughs) The glory of God is that he can take dirt balls and make them into image bearers. And that's God's purpose. So in the beginning, we have this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal God and us dirt balls. But we do get an upgrade in that he has made us his image bearers. So physically we are made in God's image, but since the garden we have some sin issues. We continue to have sin issues. And these issues of sin are breaking out all over the place in these Ephesian house churches, and they still break out in churches today. But when we start with God, we also have to start with the holiness of God. And Uh, as I become more aware of God's holiness, I also, by necessity, become aware of my own sinfulness. So I'm getting this picture of God's holiness as as I grow in my relationship to him, I realize he, he, not that he's growing more holy, I'm just aware of his holiness more. And as I'm aware of his holiness more, I'm aware of my sinfulness more which is a good thing because it keeps me in a position of humility coming before him. But there's something else that's wonderful here. But because in this huge gap between God's holiness and my sinfulness, life appeared. The life of Jesus appeared in that gap, in that huge place of, of distance 
between who I am and who he is. Jesus appeared and filled the gap with his gracious cross and his sacrifice of his life to take what I deserve upon himself so that I might be reconciled and redeemed and have a relationship with Father God. This Jesus, Jesus' life, is an eternal life that was with the Father and has appeared to us. Jesus' life and his finished work on the cross fills this huge gap between God's holiness and our sinfulness with his grace. My life is hidden with Christ in God so that God sees me enveloped, covered, united, in union, in communion with Christ. Ryan looked at three aspects of knowing him. He said, we can know him by his life, we can know him by his love, we can know him by his truth. The life appeared to us. We saw it and testified to it and proclaim it to you. Jesus, God the Son, became like us so that through his finished work on the cross we could become like him. We came to know this life by grace through faith, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the good news. So one way of knowing him is through his life that has appeared not only to John, but this life has also appeared to us. This life he lived in human form. He had to be, it had to be lived in alignment with God's moral, per, moral code or moral perfection. If God had shoplifted, he couldn't be my savior. If he had lied, he couldn't be my savior. He lived on this earth for 30 odd years in perfect alignment with God's perfect moral code as a human being. I love that about Jesus. I love that about him coming and becoming part of his own creation, the creation that would kill him so that we could become like him. Hebrews 4.14 tells us that he was tempted in every way just like we are, but he did not sin. The second one is love. When we know this life, we begin to know the love of God because we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And John will say, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 1 John 3.16. He also will say, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This is how we know him. 1 John 1, uh, 4, 7. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, 1 John 4.10. So we can know him by his life and by his love, and we can also know him by his truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying for us to the Father, and he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is the word that was from the beginning. This is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the word that was preserved by God's sovereignty for us in the Bible. This is the word that John is testifying about and proclaiming to us. So we can know him by his life and his love and his truth. And from this, 1 John 1, 3 and 4 says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write, this to make our joy complete. So last week, we looked at how God could be known, and that fellowship with God and others is an ongoing necessity to help us know him better. This week, we will look at verses 5, 6, and 7, and we're going to look at three things that are obstacles that hinder that fellowship. Aren't you joyful about that? Let me read those verses again from five on. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. One commentator has said there are three things that can hinder our fellowship with God, and they are uh, a conscience obstacle, a relational obstacle, and a doctrinal obstacle. Those three obstacles can hinder us. But I want to look just a little bit more about this fellowship by which we can know him and know others. As you well know, the word is koinonia, the word for fellowship that goes way beyond knowing him, on into sharing and partaking of him, partnership, participation, and communion. And John talks about his joy as being full and is telling us these verses that if you truly are a Christian, God is going to let you know it. He will assure you he will come close to you at times. Has that been your experience? He will come close to you. For some, like John, who is older and has been maturing in God for many years, his verbiage about intimacy with God in fellowship is probably more in line with what I believe Paul and perhaps other New Testament writers experienced. The depth of their closeness with God and camaraderie with each other didn't just happen. It didn't happen overnight. It was forged through desperate times. It was forged through joyous times. It was forged through miraculous times. It was forged in times when they didn't know what they were supposed to do next and needed an answer. They cried out to God many times in desperation for him to come to them. And as he drew near to them and spoke to them, guided them, brought them creative solutions, did the miraculous before their eyes, their eyes they developed a desire to be with him. And that's what God is calling us to. It's not that he's moved anywhere or is going anywhere. The Bible tells us draw near to him and he will draw near to us. John 16, 12, Jesus said to his disciples, I've got many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them yet. So if your fellowship with him uh, doesn't resemble Paul's or somebody else, a New Testament writer, and isn't like a Skittles waterfall where everything is just blowing your mind, don't think you don't have a relationship with him. And by the way, if someone has just hurt you badly and you're not feeling God's revealing light right now, don't feel like you don't know him. But what you should do is keep talking to him, keep coming before him, and let him direct your thoughts and actions so that this God who said to his disciples, I've got many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now, he says the same things to us. He says the very same things to us. There is, there's, there's just an enormous amount of information, godly information that he wants to impart to us and he doles it out as we need it. But to do that, we have got to come into his presence to seek him, to desire to be with him. This following is a direct quote from Pastor Frank Dane that's worthy of, of knowing and living by. He simply says, the more I involve him, the more he's involved. <laughs> he said this to me a few weeks, and, and it was, I, was so, I, I was so encaptured by it, enraptured by it. I was so uh, enthused about it, I couldn't even speak it back to him. I said, that's amazing. Like, like, duh, it's amazing. <laughs> like, you don't know that, you idiot? No. <laughs> no, it was, just so, it was just, just so fresh to me. The more I involve him, the more he's involved. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> well, it is quite a concept because the more I involve him means I have to go and be about involving him. 
It means I have to talk to him. I have to relate to him. I have to learn the truth of his word. I have to come into his presence. I have to praise and worship him. I have to practice the things that he tells us a Christian should do. I have to count him worthy. Fellowship with God is a wondrous awareness of the creator of the universe coming close to me. It can be exciting and intense like a Florida thunderstorm. It can be euphorically peaceful like a babbling brook. Or it can be breathtaking like the view of a Grand Canyon. But no matter how many times it happens, true fellowship in the presence of God will always feel new. Have you experienced that? Many times I will simply just be talking to him and all of a sudden my prayer and praise is is pouring out of me faster than I can think. And I know that you've had this experience where the next thing I'm doing is I'm bubbling and looking for Kleenex and, and, and I can feel his presence and my immediate thought is, is, is this gap that's between us, but, the, but I don't have to feel bad about this gap of his holiness and my sinfulness because Jesus has made up the difference and I don't have to hang my head in shame, but it's still inside of myself. I confess loudly and openly, why would you have anything to do with me? And at the same time, I don't feel bad about it because at that moment, God's presence is with me in such a a wonderful, close way. And it feels new. It feels shiny, bright. It's because this is the work of the Holy Spirit whose job it is to take from Jesus and bring it to us And when he does, it's glorious. Jesus said in John 16, 14, uh, he will bring glory, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. God gets the glory. We get the benefit of his closeness. What is the Holy Spirit going to take from Jesus and make it known? Mostly his word but he also brings the presence of God. His command, his unique creative ability to bring solutions that I don't have any clue how how I'm going to solve. His affirmation of love. Everyone in this room that really knows Jesus has confessed at one time or another, you know, I've read that scripture a hundred times before, but I never have quite seen it that way. Or that's something new in the scripture that I've never seen before. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit takes from Jesus and reveals it to us. And we know that this, we know that this book is not ultimate knowledge. God's going to reveal himself to us for an eternity. <laughs> I, so we've got this little piece and we can't even <laughs> decipher it. We could spend our whole lifetime going over it and over it and over, do nothing but read the word and ask him to reveal it and we still wouldn't get it all because the word is alive and living. God hasn't left us clueless as to what this intimate fellowship might look like and its effect on us. He's given us some human examples in relationship. I think God's given us the unique covenant of marriage to represent, to show us, to demonstrate what true fellowship, intimate true fellowship can look like. Last week, Ryan uh, described how people have said when he's doing worship and Christine Christine joins him on stage, his demeanor changes in a positive way. They notice that he smiles, relaxes. 
In that moment, he's not more married to her than he was five minutes before. But her presence, her closeness, her proximity make a difference. It comes with a settledness, a contentment, an assurance. I bet he got some brownie points for that one. So I can relate to this, jumping on the bandwagon. As many times I look up from my coffee cup across the table or see my wife come into the room and my heart swells with fresh feelings for her. It comes from a fellowship of knowing her, of doing life with her, of partnership, of going through struggles together and coming out on the other side more in love and stronger in our commitment for one another. I'm not trying to get all mushy on you. I'm just saying that my wife of many years is suddenly, wonderfully, newly appreciated. And she will say the same thing at times when she hears my voice, when I come through the door or over the phone, and I say, hey, baby. <laughs> it's new. It's new. God brings newness to our relationship. And he shows us, this is, this is the one thing that we have on this earth that mirrors in some way this intimate fellowship that God has with us, wants to have with us. The end of verse 5 says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. One of the great effects of the gospel is the transformation of life that occurs in the genuine believer. No, I, I, I believe that uh, conversion is an event. You know, I, I, There aren't too many people who say, you know, I, I don't... I, I really can't uh, lay my thought on, on, on that. But for me, conversion was an event. And for most people I talked to, I was made brand new. Why wouldn't it be an event? I was changed. Everything I, I looked at was different. I could now read the word and it would even make sense. Everything was new. It's an event. John speaks of this transformation as one from darkness into light. To walk in darkness means to pursue a pattern of a life uh, apart from God who is light. So the first obstacle that can hinder our fellowship is an obstacle of conscience. And this happens when we are violating our own conscience by an activity or a pursuit or ignoring the Holy Spirit's unction to do or not do something, to correct us in some way that we just table that. And when we do that, we estrange ourselves in fellowship from God. It doesn't mean we lose our salvation. It just means we're not going to have the benefit of that closeness. And for the most part, it's not because he still doesn't want to have that closeness. It's that if we come close to him, then his holiness looms larger than what I want it to. He's expecting me to walk with him. And this is kind of like walking in darkness and it can hinder our fellowship with God. Notice verses six and seven. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But notice verse seven. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sins. So I think John is saying here, when we walk in darkness, we don't have real good fellowship with one another either. <laughs> this, this light causes everything to be revealed. And that's a difficulty for us. 
It's a difficulty for us horizontally with other relationships. But if we are willing to come into his light and let him reveal whatever he needs to reveal, vertically, if we allow that to happen, knowing that knowing that he loves us and cares for us and is not going to make a judgment on that, but that his son has already died for it, and as he looks at us, he sees Jesus. And I don't have to hang my head in shame. I know I'm a dirt ball, but I know he has saved me, and I have a relationship with him. And if I can approach God in that way, it will enhance my fellowship on the horizontal level because I can confess on the horizontal level why would I, why would I be ashamed uh, of, of sin to tell you what's happening in my life when a man had to die on a cross to take care of that for me and did and says you are set free Sometimes we just make a, a particularly stubborn sin thinking, I, I can't change it. This is just the way I am. And we put it over here and make peace with it. But change starts with engaging God in fellowship and prayer. Admitting, yes, I can't change, but I'm walking towards him instead of away from him. So three obstacles that can hinder our fellowship. One is a conscience obstacle. The second is a relational obstacle. Perhaps we've just decided to see less of someone that used to be a close friend because of something they've done and injured us. And now you can't think of them without thinking of the incident or the words or they are predominant in our heads. Fellowship brings us the words of God and reveals to us their power. And since I'm an image bearer, I need to know Jesus in the truth of his word and his actions. And my favorite verse, one of my favorite verse, verses, are Romans 5, 6 through 10. I'll paraphrase. When I was powerless, a sinner, an enemy of God, that's when God demonstrated his love for me by dying on a cross. So that's his activity towards me. A powerless, radical sinner outside of his kingdom. And he comes towards me. What am I supposed to do? In this particular time, with a particular person, he says to me, go and be my image bearer. I'm not allowed to sit and hold a grudge if I want to be joyful. I want free fellowship following God. But at the same time, this is not something that you can rush into. If you're hurt, if you're really hurt, hurt's real. But by beginning beginning to talk with God, ask him how to move, what to do, He can move upon, he's not only, he will not only work on my heart, he will work on the other end. So the third one, conscience obstacle, relation obstacle, and a doctrinal uh, uh, obstacle, and I I think really the doctrinal, doctrinal obstacle that we have most often is thinking that the gospel is entry level Christianity that we truncate the gospel and say, hey, I've got the gospel, let's move on to deeper things. There is nothing deeper than the gospel. We will never find the bottom of that well while we're here on this earth. It's not just about salvation. Romans 1.16 says that I'm not ashamed, Paul says I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation, but it doesn't stop at salvation. And salvation, 
as we find out in Philippians 2.12, where she says, continue to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Does that mean that, uh, that I'm iffy on the saved part? No, it doesn't. What it means is there's still a lot left in me to be saved. You don't go from a dirt ball to a, a wonderful image bearer overnight. It takes time. So if, if, if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and I need to work out my salvation in fear and tremble, trembling, I need all of the gospel that I can get, all of the gospel understanding that I can get. The obstacle overcomer is verse 7. If we walk in the light, is he in the light? As he's in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So, well, I guess the question is, how do we walk in the light? I, I, there's, a, there's a neat little uh, trifecta here in Colossians that we need to look at in closing. And it's Colossians 1.6, starting in Colossians 1.6, and... Uh, it says, he speaks about the gospel that has come to you and says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. So Paul is talking to this young Colossae church. He's saying the gospel has come to you and all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. So the gospel being uh, people being attentive to the gospel and learning more about the gospel and understanding the gospel is causing them to grow, causing them to grow and mature and bear fruit. So he's saying it's doing this all over the world. Oh, great, all right. So now what? Well, Colossians 2.6, 1.6, 2.6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So, if the gospel is bearing fruit and growing, and so continue to live in the gospel. Continue to live in it. It's the power of God unto salvation. A lot of saving needs to be done. And do it, <laughs> rooted, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And so, okay, just for a little uh, cherry on top, uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 6 says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Notice that 5 and 6 come after. Set your heart, set your mind. So we have that fellowship. We're moving in that fellowship. The power of the gospel is speaking to us. And therefore, with that and with God's understanding and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to our earthly nature. We can't do it without him. I, you know, I didn't just become saved because I wanted to become saved. God did surgery on me. <laughs> he did it. From the inside out, I was transformed. And there's still some transformation left to do in there, so he's still continuing to work it. So the gospel bearing fruit and growing, so then just as you received Christ, continue to live in him. Set your heart on things above. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand. And Christ who is your life, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now I know that's a eschatological verse, but I also believe that God does so many things in our present time as well as he does going towards eternity. So,
real, real quick. God has given us weapons to fight with. He's bequeathed them in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, we don't fight like the world does. They've just got nuclear bombs that could blow up now 10 times over. Our weapons are powerful. They demolish strongholds and arguments and idols. <laughs> so how do we do this? How do we do this? What is this, what is this secret weapon that we have that demolishes strongholds and arguments and idols? Well, Paul will tell us it's to take thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus Christ. Now that's said a lot easier than it's done. However, it is something that Jesus bequeathed to us from the cross that we can, by the power of God, take thoughts captive and make them obedient, not to us, but to Jesus Christ. So, enjoy your fellowship with God. Draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Would you stand and pray with me? The prayer team's gonna come forward. You may be in here today feeling like, you know, that fellowship thing that you're talking, the closeness, the tears, the humility, the God's holiness. I'm not sure I get any of that. Please come and speak to one of our prayer team members uh, after the service. We'd love to speak with you. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you that uh, the way you love us is incredible. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we just ask, Lord, that you would draw us into your fellowship more and more, that when we come towards you, Lord, you would draw so close to us that we'd have those moments and desire you the way that we want to desire you, that we would be able to take thoughts captive by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for the way that you have provided for us we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.